Matthew 10, 25, Jesus says to his disciples, it is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. He says it's enough. It's enough that the disciple be as his master and the servant as his Lord. And I want to talk to you for a moment this this morning in this word that the Lord has given me and ask you a question. I'm going to keep this question before you throughout this message this morning. Are we called by the Lord Jesus Christ to be converts or are we called to be disciples? Are we called by the Lord to be converts or to be disciples? And what I mean by convert, I'm talking about someone that's genuinely born again, that's given their life to Christ by faith. And they're washed in his blood. Certainly, we have to be a convert. But I want to ask this question. Do you think that God ever intended for men to convert to Christianity, to become Christians in the sense of believing the gospel, being saved by faith, by the grace of the Lord, washed in his cleansing blood, and yet not for that individual not to go on and spend their life for him and with him? Do you think God ever intended that? To come to him, be washed in his blood, be saved by grace through faith, and yet not live their life with him and for him. Do you think God ever intended that when he sent his son? Do you think he ever intended that? I don't think so either. Do you think he ever intended for somebody to come and and give their life to Jesus and say, come into my heart, be my savior. And from that moment forward, not to go on and follow Jesus Christ. From that moment on, not to walk in obedience. From that moment on, not to know the will of their God and do the will of their God. To not become, from that moment on, more like the one that saved them. Do you think that that's anywhere in the Bible or anywhere in God's heart or His plan? That I want them to come to me and I want to save save them from their sin. But then they can just live how they want afterwards. Go back and live how they were living before. Let me tell you, and I know you know this, but everything in the Bible reveals a God that's a God of love. Everything that's in the word of God reveals God's heart of love. His, it reveals his plan and his will for us and for our lives that God desires to, to, to bring sinful men unto himself. And we're all sinners, right? God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And yet he loved us anyway. He loved us anyway. And and he gave his only son. And the Bible says that the Lord's heart, we know it. It's not a big mystery. His plan, his will for your life and for my life and his heart is extending out to show that through his son, Jesus, and through Calvary's cross reveals a will and a heart of God to bring men unto himself. Right. Right. As as Jesus, when he was uh, crying out over Jerusalem, I've desired to gather you together as a mother hen would gather her chicks together and you would not. That is God's heart. Amen. He desires to bring sinful men unto himself to be cleansed, washed, forgiven and bring them unto himself like a shepherd gathers up his sheep. Just listen to this first in Ephesians. You don't have to turn there. Ephesians 219. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. He didn't just save us and forgive us of the penalties and consequences of sin. You're no no more strangers and foreigners. The Bible says one time we were far off, but by the blood of Jesus, we've been made not. God wants to bring men unto himself. Okay, bring men unto himself, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. He desires not to help us at an arm's length. You know what I mean by that? I was kind of picturing this in my mind. You know, in the in the, in the Bible days in the, and when we read about the, the leper colonies, right, where the, the, the person that had this disease, uh, there's no cure for leprosy. And they would be basically banished to a leper colony to live somewhere out. Out of the outskirts of town, someplace where other people didn't live. And if he was even to pass by a crowd of people, he'd have to cry from the other side of the street, unclean, unclean. And he, they would live in a leper colony and they would die in a leper colony with other people with leprosy. And Jesus is not just somebody that's like throwing a hand grenade of medicine and saying, I want to help you lepers out there in the leper colony. Catch this medicine and it'll cure you. That's not the picture that I get of our Savior. He wants to bring men unto himself. He wants to bring men unto himself. He's not just helping us at an arm's length from a distance. 
He's a God that's near. And the Bible says, Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am there, you may be also. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you and I want you to come. I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself so that you will be with me. The Lord wants us to be with him. He didn't simply forgive us of our sins and rescue us from the consequences of sin, which is eternal separation from him and death and torment and a lake of fire. He didn't simply do that and then leave us off on our own somewhere. Be nice knowing you have a good life. I'm glad I could save you from your sins and you're not going to die and go to hell. See you. That's not the savior that we have. That's not his heart. That's not the Lord. He doesn't say, go have a good life now that I've saved you. Wasn't that a nice thing that I did for you? He makes us his sons. He makes us his daughters. He tells us in this word that we're going to reign with him. We're going to rule with him. Everything's with him. You see that? Everything is with him, wants to be with him. And I want you to picture this, uh, a marriage, for example. The Bible says, Lee, when he preaches uh, weddings, and I'm sure of y'all, most of y'all have heard Lee preach a wedding. It's wonderful. The weddings, the Lord's really gifted him to preach weddings. And, and uh, he makes this so clear that marriage is a picture of Christ and his church, right? Marriage is a picture of Christ and his church. Now, in a marriage... The marriage is a whole lot more than just the wedding. Amen. The marriage is a whole lot more than just the wedding. Amen. It's not just a wedding. It is it is that's that consummates it. That brings it all. That's the beginning of it. But the wedding just marks a, a marriage is a lifetime to be spent together. Right. It's it's about spending the rest of your life with that one that you have committed yourself to. They have committed themselves to you and we're joined in the eyes of God and man. Something that the Lord's created and it's to build a life together, to spend a life together from that moment forward. The marriage is just the beginning of that, right? It's just the beginning of that. So picture this as a as a, a picture of Christ in his church from the moment that you said I do to Jesus. I do believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I do call upon you to be my Savior and Lord. I do give myself to you. Come into my heart. Be my Savior. From the moment that you say I do to the Lord. The Bible says that that's the, that's the beginning of salvation. We've passed from death to life. That's just the entrance. That's just the wedding. Okay? Now you've got a marriage. It's to spend the rest of, the, of your life with this one. That is his desire. That is his desire. Okay? And uh, to, to bring us now, he, the Bible says he calls us by his name, right? We're called by the name of the Lord now. When the moment we say I do to the Lord, we become his. We become his property. We, he's purchased us, uh, purchases us with his blood. He comes to us and he comes to live in us. It says in John 14, I and my father will make our dwelling place in your heart. We'll make our abode, our dwelling place in your heart, and I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He purchased us forever. He bought us by his blood forever. And I want to just wonder sometimes, where did the notion come from that a man can be saved and yet not follow Christ? Where did that notion come from? It didn't come from the scriptures. Where does the notion come from that a man, I'm not talking about perfection, okay? Just so you know that. But where does the notion come from that a man can believe in Jesus yet not want to be with Jesus? I believe in Jesus, but I don't want to be with Jesus. I believe he's the Savior and I've, I've asked him to be my Savior, yet I don't want to be with him. Profess him, profess Christ, yet have no desire for Christ. Now I want you to picture this same marriage. They got a, They technically are married. You know the, the wedding day, how you sign the, the marriage license and you have that somewhere stuck in your closet. You've got a marriage license if you're married and it's legal and it's official and you have it there. But let's picture these two people. Let's say that they had the wedding, but they don't live together. They don't speak to each other. They don't care about each other. They don't care about what the other one likes or wants or how they can please them in any way. They don't share their life together. They don't share their dreams together. And their most intimate thoughts and so forth together. Now, technically, they still have a marriage license. 
And there was a wedding that God was present and witnesses were present. And they said, I do. Technically, you could call that a marriage, but that's not really a marriage, is it? That's not really a marriage. That's not really what God intended when he says, I'll take two and make them one. And remember, a person coming to Christ is, a, is a, like an example of a, a Christ and is a, with his church as a marriage of a, a husband and wife. The Lord has called us to be his people, his body. And you all this is what we're going to talk about this morning. He's called us to be his disciples, his disciples. A disciple is a learner or a pupil, okay, a student or a follower. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter uh, 3. And I'll tell you this, we're going to look at a lot of scriptures this morning. So if you're taking notes, you may not have turn, time to uh, turn to them all and read them. You may, but, but we're going to be looking at a lot of scriptures. Mark chapter 3, verse 13. Mark three thirteen. And he goeth up into a mountain and called unto him whom he would. And they came unto him and he ordained twelve that they should be with him. And that he might send them for to preach and to have power to heal sickness and to cast out devils. Jesus goes up in the mountain and we read in some of the other gospels that he had prayed all night in Matthew, for example. And then he called unto him whom he would and they came unto him. He calls men where unto him. Men came unto him. OK, and he ordained the twelve that they should be with him. I want you twelve men to be with me. Not a very short period of time, roughly three and a half years or so, I'll be taken from you physically. But for now, and the rest of the time I have on this earth right now in his earthly ministry, he chose 12 men that they might be with him. And they were with him all the way unto the end, right? All the way unto the end. But this is what he called them to do. Now, now the Lord put this message on my heart uh, uh, actually a couple of weeks ago. About a week and a half ago, I knew I was going to be talking about discipleship. It's just the thing that the Lord had put on my heart. And I came over here and was praying and studying really for several days and just nothing would come to me. It's such a huge subject, discipleship. Where do you even begin talking about being a disciple of the Lord and nothing would come? I couldn't write anything on the paper. I couldn't get any thoughts together, but I knew this is what I was going to talk about. And at three o'clock in the morning, one morning, I woke up and it was just instantly on my thoughts. I woke up thinking about discipleship. Um, three in the morning, I'm laying in the bed and the Lord just gives it to me. Bam, bam, bam. He goes, I want you to talk about these things. And I said, that's it, Lord. The call of discipleship, the cost of discipleship and the crown of discipleship, the call of discipleship, the cost of discipleship and the crown of discipleship. Look with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Matthew at Matthew chapter nine. The call of discipleship in Matthew chapter nine, verse nine. And Jesus and as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. Mark chapter one. Verse 16. Mark chapter one, verse 16. Just for time's sake, I'm going to go ahead and read these verses. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed. Now, Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's what I'm doing with my life. The, the, the time that he makes this statement under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul does in Philippians chapter three, he's already been saved for years. He's already been uh, living for the Lord for years. And yet he realizes there's a high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I don't think that high calling is just to be a missionary. I don't think it was something that was just specific and unique to him. I think that every born again believer has a high, high calling of God in Christ Jesus upon our life. And we're to press towards the mark for the prize of this high calling in Christ Jesus. There's a call of God upon our life. Jesus intended for these men when he called Matthew. 
who was a tax collector and said, follow me. He gets up and he leaves the table and he follows him. When he calls the four fishermen, the two sets of brothers, they left their nets and they went and followed. He intends for men, for us and for these men that we read about in the Bible to come and be with him and to follow him. And all that will come to him, he desires for them to come and follow him. Come with him. Follow him. Not simply tell him some good news and then leave. Okay? Not simply tell them some good news. Here's some food for thought. Here's some things that are most radical things you've ever heard. Listen to my sermons. Listen to my preaching. And stay there. And I'll go on. He calls men unto himself. This is what I'm wanting us to see and what the Lord's wanting us to see. Okay, not simply tell us something, but to be the God, as it says in Zephaniah, the Lord, thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He's in our midst. He's in our life. Not simply uh, give us something, but give himself. Okay, give himself to us. And, And look in John chapter eight, verse 32. I'm sorry, verse 30, John 8, 30. Now, he's speaking to in public. He's speaking before uh, many Jews and, and they're listening to him more than just his disciples at this point. And he's, as he spake this, these words, it says in verse 30, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. If you continue in my word, then you're my disciples. If you continue on. And from from where you've begun, you believe that's good that you believe. Now, if you continue in my words, you are my disciples. Indeed, what is the Lord saying? He's saying, come and follow me. What did he tell the fishermen? Come and follow me. What did he tell Matthew, the tax collector? Come and follow me. One thing that we that we see about the life of a disciple is that the disciple must follow his Lord. He's got to follow his Lord. He's not just God somewhere way off over there that saved me and thank you. We're to follow the Lord. I love this verse. These are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. They were redeemed from among men being the first fruits unto God and to the lamb. That's in Revelation 14, 4. These are they which follow the lamb wherever he goes. That's what a disciple is. He follows the Lord. They just follow the Lord wherever he goes. Just following the Lord wherever he goes. This is what a disciple does. He's got to follow the Lord. We can't stay where we are. We've got to move as God leads us to move. He stirs us up. He says, forsake this, leave this, follow me. You cannot stay where you are. You have to go with God because he's moving. He's not sitting still. And he's wanting to take your life and make you more like Jesus Christ. It's not enough to just agree that he's my savior and that he's my Lord and go to church. He's calling you to a life of discipleship. He's calling me to a life of discipleship. So in order to do that, I have to be where he is. Come and follow me. One's a tax collector. One's a fisherman. One may have this job or that job. Come and follow me. This is what a disciple does. Another thing we see about the life of a disciple and the call of the disciple, which we're talking about now, now the call of discipleship is that God desires to take that man or that woman who's professed faith in him and make them something that they are not now. Not only does he say, follow me, he told Peter and James and Andrew and John, I'll make you something that you're not now. Right now, you're fishermen. I'll make you fishers of men. I'm going to make you something that you're not now. I'm going to take you from where you are and I myself, if you'll follow me, I'll make you into something or another man that you're not now. OK, so there's the call of the disciple to follow the Lord. And as we follow the Lord, he's taken us and making us something that we're currently not. We're presently not and we cannot be apart from following the Lord. You could read lots of books on it. Jesus said, take my yoke and follow me. Right. Learn of me. If I'm in a yoke with Jesus, I got to be moving where he moves because that yoke yokes the two of us together. And if he's going, I've got to go. And if he's standing still, I've got to stand still. And if he turns left, I've got to turn left. And if he's going to go into persecution, I've got to go into persecution, whatever it may be. I'm yoked to him. But if I will go with him and if I will follow him, he'll make me what I'm currently not. 
He was going to take Peter and John and make them what they weren't before. But it was only going to happen as they followed Jesus. This is part of the call of the disciple. He wants to make us something that we're not. Now, and this is from another passage we opened up in Matthew. But in Luke 6, it says the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect, which means mature, or complete, shall be as his master. That's going to come as we follow Christ. If I come down to this altar a sinner and pray, pray for the Lord to be my Savior and Lord and mean it by faith, the Bible says I'm saved right then. I pass from death to life right then. But I can't say I'm all the way like my Savior, right? I may still smell like cigarette smoke. I still may still be in the midst of, of all kinds of things that are going on in my life right now. I know nothing of the Scriptures other than there's a Savior who died for me. His name's Jesus, and I believe in Him. Hallelujah, I'm as saved as I'll ever be, but I'm not, as, I'm not a disciple at that point. I'm not one who the, the Lord's taken and transformed. But as I, if I'll get up from that altar and follow the Lord, come and follow me. He's saying, Randy, come follow me now. Come follow me now. I've chosen the twelve to be with me. I've chosen you to be with me. Come and follow me. I'll make you something that you are not right now. It's enough that the disciple be as his master. And the servant as his Lord. We're to be made more like Jesus. It comes as we follow him. Amen. It comes as we follow him. We're called. We have a calling of God to be a disciple. I want to move on the cost of discipleship. The cost of discipleship. Can I tell you it's going to cost something to follow the Lord? What is the cost? What is the cost to be a disciple of the Lord? What is the cost, the cost to follow the lamb, whithersoever he goeth. Everything. That's what it costs. And nobody wants to preach that today for the most part. Nobody wants to tell you that for the most part today. But it costs everything. It costs everything to follow the Lord. That's what the Bible says. There is a great cost to follow the Lord. Salvation is an absolute free gift. Cost me nothing. Cost God his only son. Jesus died on the cross, shed his life's blood till he breathed his last and said it's finished and gave up the ghost. And his body's put in a grave and rolled a big stone over it. And the Lord didn't suffer his body to see corruption. And on the third day, just like he promised, he raised him from the dead. But it cost him his only son. It's free to me. Salvation is free to me. It costs me nothing, not a dime, not a penny, not a second of my time. It's finished on the cross. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. That's what the Bible says. I'm not trying to add to it nor take away from it. It costs me nothing. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what the Bible teaches. I won't add anything to that at all. But to be a disciple of the Lord is what he, he intends for every born again man or woman or young person. To, to be a disciple, to follow Christ, to follow the Lamb wherever He goes, will cost you absolutely everything. It will. It will cost you everything. Now, does that mean He'll take it off from you instantly? No. But it will cost you everything. You give it all, and you don't pretend to give it all. You give it all. You give your life. You give your time. You give your dreams, your goals, your pursuits, your friendships. Everything you want to do, your comforts, luxuries, finances, your home. You give it all to the Lord. And you follow him. It costs everything to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. He calls us all and it costs us all. It costs us everything. Salvation is free. The thief on the cross didn't do one thing. Didn't follow the Lord anywhere except he went on and died probably the same day when the, the, the soldiers broke his legs. He died after the Lord. Didn't cost him anything to be with Jesus that day in paradise, right? Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So don't think that we're teaching, that I'm teaching that there's something we have to add to salvation, that we have to earn it or strive for. it. It's a free gift, just like the thief on the cross. But to follow Christ, the cost of discipleship is very high. It costs us everything. Well, I want you to read in your Bibles in Matthew chapter 18. I'm going to just say this, even at this point in the, in the message. Just let the Lord 
speak to you this morning, whatever he's showing you, okay, about this message and about your own life. We're going to have some time, as we always do, to pray and to seek the Lord and just be thinking what God might have you to do today, how he might have you to surrender to him in some way today. I believe he's going to just just meet with you in a great way. Matthew chapter eight. I know I said 18. Matthew chapter eight. Verse 18, Matthew 8, 18. Now, when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. A certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. Chapter 10, Matthew 10, verse 17. We really could read this whole chapter, but for time's sake, we're not. Matthew 10, 17. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in the synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and of the Gentiles. Verse 22. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Verse 37. Same chapter. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. This is what the Lord requires. This is what the Lord requires. And this is why many don't follow him. You know, a lot don't follow him, right? A lot of people that that speak the name of Jesus... And will claim some type of relationship with Jesus. But this is why a lot of people don't follow Jesus. It's not really a secret, is it? This is why a lot of people don't follow the Lamb wherever He goes. I want to read. Some of y'all might have heard about uh, Amy Carmichael and and her life. And if you haven't read this book, it's a wonderful book by Elizabeth Elliot, A Chance to Die. And it talks about her life and uh, living in in the late 1800s, early 1900s. The Lord called her as a teenager. OK, as a teenager, her life from that point on was never her own. Her life was absolutely not her own. There was opportunities she had to marry. There were opportunities she had to to do things even within Christian service and so forth that would have been fine and respectable. The Lord called her to a very, very, very unusual life where she lived in India her whole life. She gave herself for the people there for Christ. OK, in the orphanage. And, and, and rescuing these children and so forth that were dedicated to the temple as temple sacrifices and so forth and lived there among them and died there among them. And she had a very unusual calling. And she said this when the Lord began to call her as a teenager and she was deliberating, she said to be like Christ, to display, displace self from the inner throne and to enthrone him, to make not the slightest compromise with the smallest sin We aim at nothing less than to walk with God all day long, to abide every hour in Christ and he and his words in us, to love God with all the heart and our neighbors as ourselves. The Lord called her. She had she had pictured herself even as a believer that she was going to stay with the people she was. She had some little inner city ministries where she would try to reach the uh, the orphans and so forth in her in her home town and so forth. And, and but she heard the call very clearly where God says, go ye, go ye. And she says it was inescapable and irresistible. And she wrote a letter to her mother telling about this call. Remember, she's a teenager and she knew she this is not a mission trip that she was going on. She was going. No plans of coming back. It was a call to go, go ye. And she writes this letter to her mother. My precious mother, she wrote, have you given your child unreservedly to the Lord for whatever he wills? Oh, may he strengthen you to say yes to him if he asks something which costs. It costs to follow the Lord. It costs to follow the Lord. This is the response of her mother. 
She says, my precious, my own precious child, he who hath led will lead all through the wilderness. He who hath fed will surely feed. He who hath heard the cry will never close his ear. He who hath marked thy faintest sigh will never, will not forget thy tear. He loveth always, faileth never. So rest on him today forever. She says, no, Amy, you go. He is yours and you are his to take you where he pleases and to use you as he pleases. I can trust you to him. And I do all day. He has helped me and my heart unfailingly. My heart unfailingly says, go ye. She gives up her daughter to go. The daughter gives up her life. It wasn't her own. From the minute she got born again, she was purchased by the blood of Jesus. And my life is not my own. Now, we're not all called to India, okay? But we're all called to be disciples. We're not all called to go uh, live a solitary life apart from our families like that. But we're all called to be His. Holy and completely and thoroughly His. Every bit. And to give all for Him. The cost is very high. You know, one thing I do appreciate, well, many things I appreciate about the gospel and about the, the Lord is that he never tried to hide that fact, did he? Preachers do that today. Especially if like they're trying to reach lost people or they're trying to reach young people and so forth. A lot of times they'll hide that fact because they want to say that wherever you are, it's a lot of this uh, seeker friendly, easy believe type gospel is that wherever you are, whatever you're doing, that's fine. Jesus wants, just wants to come along and make it a little bit better. He wants to help you. He wants to save you from that nasty place called hell. And he just wants to, if you're, if you're playing football, he wants to make you a better football player. If you're doing this, he wants to make you a better that. He wants to be a little somebody that sits on your shoulder and is a little good luck charm that helps you through life. You know, when you're going, when you're sad, he'll make you happy. And the thing is, he can do all those things. But nowhere in the Gospels do you see that type of call. That type of call, it will cost everything. It cost everything. And this is why so few people follow. You know, there's one point where Jesus had 70 disciples, right? 70 disciples. You read about it in John chapter 6. And he begins to preach and the messages get a little harder. A little harder. And they left. And he turns to the 12 and said, are you going to leave also? Y'all going to leave too? And they said, Lord, where will we go? We know we're convinced that you're the savior of the world and you have the words of eternal life. Who are we going to turn to besides you? But he never tried to hide that fact. Some follow for a while like those 70 and then turn back, don't they? Some follow the Lord for a while and say, you know, this is pretty good. And they're just marching along like like you're going to go on uh, some big camping trip. And you know that adrenaline you got when you're, you're first excited about it and you got a backpack on and you, everybody's talking about what the lake's going to look like and the campfire and we're going to do this. And you take off and after a couple of hours of hiking and people, are, it's not so much fun anymore and they're dragging and they're tired. That's kind of how it is sometimes with people that, that are walking with the Lord. They follow for a while and then it gets to be too much for them. At some point along the way, for some people, it's not worth it anymore. I mean, let's be honest, for some people, they get to some point, whatever that point is, it's a test of their faith, a trial of their faith. They're offended or the world's offended by them and they don't like being thought of as being peculiar or whatever it may be. It's like the seed that fell by the wayside, sprung up with joy, but it didn't have any root. OK, and then when the sun comes, it has no root and it's scorched. Because it didn't have any root, it withered and bore no fruit and died. And it says that sun that scorched it was the offense, the persecution that arose from the world. All of a sudden, your friends think you're weird. Your friends think you're strange. And we are. Well, I didn't count on this. I didn't count on this. I didn't plan on this. I didn't know it was going to cost me this. And they back off. Many people do that. They back off. But the Lord's calling us to follow him. Paul says that Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and is departed. Demas walked with Paul and with the Lord and served elbow to elbow with Paul in the ministry. At some point towards the end of Paul's life, Demas had forsaken the Lord, loved the present world and went back to it. Loved the present world, went back to it and, and he departed and left 
They thought they were committed to Christ, but the offense showed that they weren't. The persecution showed that they weren't. The trial of their faith showed that they weren't. John says they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be manifest that they were not all of us. If they'd really been of us, they would have continued with us. They would have continued with the Lord and walking with the Lord. It doesn't mean, y'all, that on the, along this way, sometimes we don't stumble and fall in sin and get our eyes off the Lord and have to ask for forgiveness because we do. But the point is, I'm not going back to that. I'm going to catch up with Jesus. Amen. I'm going to catch up to him. I'm not going back to there because there's nothing back there. I've already been there. That's like Lot leaving Sodom. I'm not what is back there. There's nothing. I'm not going back there. OK, and I'm going to stay with the Lord and I'm going to keep my eyes on the Lord. There's a cost to follow the Lord. The rich young ruler didn't want to pay it, did he? It's a sad story when you really look at it, because it's not just so we love money. I think there's a lot more to the story. He came to the Lord and I think he was very sincere. This is what makes it all the more sad. He came to the Lord and he says, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And the Lord tells him. The Lord tells me he asked the right person, he asked the right question. And I think he was very sincere. He knew, he knew in his heart or he'd have never asked in the first place that he was lacking something, right? I've done these things. What am I lacking? I know I'm lacking something. Jesus says he's serious about this. Let me tell you, sell all that you have, give it to the poor and come and follow me. All that you have. Did Jesus need his money? Jesus wasn't even going to get his money. He was going to give it all to the poor. Sell all that you have. Come and follow me. Because I'm moving on this way. And you'll have treasures in heaven. You'll have eternal life. And the man went away sad. And Jesus was sad. Because that's one he's going to die for in a very short time. Jesus was sad. But let me tell you what else Jesus didn't do. He didn't go back and chase after the man. Wait, 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 wait. It's really not that bad. It's not going to cost you that much. I didn't mean that. He didn't do that. He didn't change the message. He didn't change the story. It was what it was. The man needed to hear the truth. Because God's going to tell the truth. Amen. About that. He wasn't for him. It wasn't worth it. If any man will come after me. We know the verse. Let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. It is a life. This is not a part time commitment. You understand that? This is a life of self-denial. This is every day getting up and as David did set the Lord before him. Deny myself. Take up my cross and follow Jesus. If any man doesn't do that, he cannot be a disciple of the Lord. I can't be. You can't be. It is a daily dying to self. Daily dying to self. I love this story. I can't remember exactly where I heard it. The illustration is given if you were if you were living in Rome, for example, in the days of Jesus and under that Roman rule. If you saw a man carrying a cross heading out of town. You might not know what crime he committed or anything like that. There's one thing you knew for sure. He wasn't coming back. He's not coming back. He's got that cross And that's how we're to be. And the Lord wants to know this morning. I know he wants to know this morning. Who's who's willing to follow and not go back? There's too many people that go back. You knew that man wasn't coming back. He's carrying a cross. Cross works. It's effective for what it does. Everybody that gets on it, nobody comes down off of it. You see a man following, carrying a cross and heading out of town. Don't know his name. Don't know what he did. Don't know when he got caught. I know he ain't coming back here. The Lord wants to know who's willing to follow him and not go back. It costs us something. It costs us something to follow the Lord wherever he goes. Thirdly, I want to look at this. The crown. Of the disciple, the crown of discipleship. In Revelation chapter 22, I'm going to go ahead and read it. It's verse 12. 
the Lord says, the end of the end of the whole Bible and the end of Revelation. And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. And I want to tell you this this morning, that it will be worth it. Those that fall apart way and to them, it's no longer worth it. They don't see the Lord. Like you see the Lord, like I see the Lord, they don't see him. The Bible says that Moses endured as seeing him who's invisible. He saw him. So the Bible says he could he chose he made a choice to suffer affliction with the people of God. At that time, there was affliction for the people of God. They were slaves and then they were wandering in the wilderness, wandering 40 years. He made a choice. I'm going to choose to suffer affliction with the people of God to identify myself with God, to serve Jehovah God in this little brief life, choosing rather to serve affliction with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. The Bible says he had respect unto the recompense of reward. You know what that means? He knew the Lord was going to do it. He had respect for that reward that God was going to give. And this little thing that he went through back here is nothing in comparison to that. And to him, it was worth it. I will follow him. I will follow him. I'll live for him and I'll die for him. But I'm staying with him. I'll live for him. I'll die for him. I'm staying with him. There's a crown that comes. Paul said, not for me only, but all those that love his appearing. He writes this, the last little few phrases he writes on his earthly life, y'all. He knows his time of his departure is at hand. He's about to be beheaded for the cause of Christ in the name of Jesus and bearing his testimony in the world. He knows it. And he says he's rejoicing. I finished my the, the course. I fought the good fight. There's a crown laid up for me. That's what I've been looking at all these years. I've been pressing towards the high calling of the prize of God in Christ Jesus upon my life. And my eyes are fixed upon that one that I'm going to meet face to face. It's not for me only, but all those that love his appearing. Look with me, if you would, at Second Corinthians chapter four. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse 16. For which cause we faint not. The Lord doesn't want you to faint. It's hard sometimes. It costs a lot. It's difficult sometimes. I'm not talking about the self-pity, poor me. Sometimes it's genuinely hard to live for Christ. The same world that crucified Jesus is, one, is going to want to crucify you. We're seeing it more and more in our country. Where it's a hate crime to tell a homosexual the truth about it, his life or lifestyle. Same world that crucified Jesus wants to crucify us. For this, which cause we faint not, but... Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I can promise you the Lord, our Lord and Savior, the one who purchased us with his blood, called us to follow him. We'll make sure that it's worth it all. Amen. He'll make sure that it's worth it all. He'll wipe away every tear, the Bible says. Paul says, I count it all dumb. All that's behind me. I count it all as dumb that I may know him. Right. That I may know him, that I might have Christ Jesus. Now, I've never heard ever. I'll speak for myself. I'll speak for those that I've been around in my life of Christianity and reading through the scriptures as well and reading books about other Christians in their lives. I've never, ever, ever met one individual that followed the Lord with all their heart, gave themselves fully to the Lord, like Joshua, Caleb, wholly followed the Lord. I've never met anybody that wholly followed the Lord and regretted it. Now, I haven't seen them when they died and, and went on to be with the Lord, okay? But in this life, I've never met anybody that says I'm a servant of the Lord. I've followed him all these days, all my life. You know what? It's really been a letdown. It's really been a letdown. God's not been faithful. He's really not all he's cracked up to be and so forth. I've never, ever, never 
come across or heard of a story of anybody that that's happened to. It's impossible. He is the highest pursuit of life. He is the highest pursuit of life. So if I pursue after him, then what else can compare to the uncreated God that made me? Knowing him, walking with him, being with him, fellowshipping with him, being loved by him, loving him, knowing him, intimately walking with him. What could compare to that? I've never met anybody, and you won't either meet anybody that's, that comes to the Lord and is disappointed, okay, regretted. Boy, I wish I hadn't followed the Lord like that. You know what I have met? I've met people that wish they followed the Lord. Have you? They left the church. They left the Lord. They got away from the Lord. They got away from his word. They went back into the world like a dog to his vomit. They look like a dog is going back to their vomit. To where life's brought them and where sin's brought them. And they look up at you kind of out of their, their low estate and looking at you. And you're just saying, it's just what the Lord has done in me. This could be you. Your life didn't have to end up this way. And even now, God can take you out of it. Hallelujah. Even right, right now, today, He can take you out of it. I've met people that wish they'd followed the Lord. I, I came and got born again when I was between my junior and senior year in high school. But I lived about five years, very much on the fence, very much one foot in the world and one in the church. I'd say probably two thirds in the world and one third in the church. I lived that way. And my only thing is now, I wish I hadn't have done that. I mean, I love my walk with the Lord now. And God's made it all it's supposed to be. My only regret is I didn't get saved sooner. That I didn't sell out to Jesus Christ sooner. That's my regret. I didn't tell people in, at LSU about Jesus. So I was too busy living like them. When I knew better. It'll be worth it all. Look at Matthew chapter 19. We're about to close. Matthew chapter 19. The Lord himself will make sure it's worth it for us, y'all. Paul said, I'm persuaded that I know whom I believed. Amen. I'm persuaded that he's able to keep all that I've committed unto him against that day. Matthew 19, verse 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Just straight up asking him, right? We've forsaken all, and they had. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones. Now this is specifically for the disciples, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Lee's been preaching for several weeks now on heaven, right? It's been wonderful preaching on heaven, that, and preaching on that new heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, that God has prepared for us. We're going to live with the Lord forever. There'll be no need of the sun in that city because Jesus will be the light of that city. But y'all, it'll be worth it all. We, we get to walk with Jesus now. I get to walk with him now in a world that doesn't know him. We're no more strangers and pilgrims from the Lord. We're strangers and pilgrims on this earth, but not from the Lord. We're not strangers and pilgrims. We've been made part of his body, part of the household of God. We have that now. He walks with us. He speaks to us. He loves us as his own. The Apostle John didn't ever want to leave his side. We get to walk with him in love. We get to walk in the light of his word. We're heirs to all the promises of God. He empowers us by his spirit to live for him and to overcome this world. Because he's overcome. And I'm with him and he's in me. Then we overcome. We have an overcoming life. The Bible says it greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost me something. I think it's going to cost more in the days ahead than it costs right now. The Bible says the gates of hell won't prevail against the Lord's church. We have the Lord's joy fulfilled in us 
even now. And listen to what Jesus said. This is right before he was arrested in the garden. He's with his disciples and he's praying to his father and he's saying the glory father, which thou gavest me, I've given them that they may be one, even as we are one. To be one with the Lord, to walk with the Lord, the, the crown of discipleship. There's a call that we're all called to. There's a cost. It's going to cost you everything to follow the Lord. And there's a crown. There's rewards that the Lord gives in this life and the life to come that I I can't even, I don't even feel like I've touched on this morning. I want to close with this right here. Reese Howells is an unusual man. He he was a Christian, a godly man back in the the, late 1800s, early 1900s in Wales. And he had an unusual call upon his life to be an intercessor. And this is a book about his life called The Intercessor. And he had a, an intercessory ministry. I mean, he prayed. It was a calling. It wasn't just like, I think I'll go be an intercessor. I like to pray. God called him to pray. Pray rather than run out and look for a solution. He would pray. If he heard somebody that was, was sick, he would pray until they were healed. I mean, he just he was an intercessor. It was a life that he was called to. It was a specific calling on his life. And he was praying for... Uh, for the souls in Africa, had a real burden for the lost souls in Africa that there's very little light, very few people go into that part of the world to bring Christ and his gospel. And the Lord says, I will answer the prayer through you. I'll send you both there, him and his wife. So as he's praying, he's, th- he's spent his life praying for other people and missionaries to go and people to be healed. And, and it was a, a unusual life. He's in his room and people are doing other things and going on with life. He's locked up praying. Praying and praying. It was a call. Okay? But God says, I'm going to use you and your wife to be the answer to this prayer. He wasn't really ready for that. Okay? Because he knew the type of lifestyle. He had, in fact, he had advised other, a young missionary couple, you can't go there and have children. You can't bring a child there. Too dangerous. The lifestyle is just too demanding. It's no place to raise a child. Too dangerous. Too many sicknesses and so forth. And little did he know that as he's praying that and counseling them in that, that God's saying, you're the one I'm going to send. You and your wife. And they had a little boy named Samuel. He says it was the first test on the call and the greatest. And he says, Mr. Howells recalls this story. The Savior had said, anyone who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now the Holy Ghost said to us, you must prove to me that you love the souls of of the Africans who are to live for eternity more than you love your own son. Does he really mean it? I wondered. Yes, he meant it. Many many times I had preached about Abraham giving up Isaac. And it emphasized the words, take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest. How little had I realized what it had meant to him. We were to surrender our son Samuel as really, as surely as God surrendered his own son and Abraham his own son. Unless your surrender is real and up to the standard, you will break down long before the end. It's got to be a real surrender. He was calling them to give their son up. They had to give their son up. For a suitable couple to adopt him and raise their son. And this wasn't a call for a mission trip. They were going. Just like Amy Carmichael. They were going. They loved their son. He was their only son. And the call was upon their life. It cost them something. Amen. It cost them something. And he talks about the day when they actually gave their son over. They put him in the hands of another couple. The scene that followed can better be imagined than described. And we were glad we only had to go through it once in a lifetime. We proved that night that Africa was going to cost us something. And we were coming up to the victory by degrees. I mean, little by little, God was giving them the strength to do it. Okay? He comes home that, that night. And basically, he's very concerned about not only giving up his son, he's concerned about his wife and how she's going to bear up under all this. When I came home that night, I asked my wife... How did you get through? She said she went to the garden and wept and thought to herself, I've been singing that hymn many a time. This is a phrase from that hymn, but we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. And this morning I can prove it. But then the Lord told me, measure it with Calvary. Measure your sacrifice with Calvary. And with those words, she came through. 
And praying out together afterwards, the Lord showed me the reward. He said to us, for everything you give up for me, there is the hundredfold. And on this, you can claim 10,000 souls in Africa. And we believed it. It costs something to follow the Lord. It costs something to follow the Lord. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm simply telling you what the word of God says. He calls us to be disciples. There is a cost in being a disciple. And he rewards us more than you and I could ever imagine. Eyes not seen, neither ear heard, neither is entered to the heart of man. The things that God hath prepared for them that love him. But his spirit reveals it unto us. We can have it in our hearts. We can have it in our spirit because the Lord shows us. D, you can come. And I just want you to stand this morning if you would. You know, when Mary and Martha were weeping at Lazarus' tomb and Jesus had purposely delayed his coming. Okay, purposely delayed his coming. And then they hear that Jesus is coming and kind of the news spreads. He's coming. He's coming. And run and tell Mary and Martha, and I just like this little phrase. It says, the master is come and calleth for thee. The master is come and he's calling for you. And they went running out to meet him. I just want to tell you this morning, the master's come. He's calling for you. He's calling for you. He's calling for you. He's calling for a life of dedication. He's calling for a life on the altar. He's not wanting you to bring money and put it on the altar. He's wanting you to lay your life at the altar. And when you get up and walk out, you don't belong to yourself anymore. It's not enough to profess him as Savior and Lord. He's called us to a life of discipleship. And it costs something to follow the Lord. You just come as God leads you. And lay your life down at the altar. It doesn't matter to me if there's a lot of people or a few people. But I do pray that you're sincere when you come. I do pray that you're sincere when you come.